Please be seated. Proceedings are resumed. The Honorable Member from Northside is recognized. He has a speaking time of 50 minutes remaining. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, when we took the lunch and break, I was beginning to deal with the um, lack of concern and, and lack of commitment and lack of reference in the budget statement, the throne speech, or the budget to the needs of our senior citizens. So, now, Madam Speaker, in, in addition to being a big proponent and a practitioner of what I call participative democracy, where I really believe that the people that I represent have an inherent right to be a part of to and involved in any decision that I make on their part as their representative. I have always tried to consider myself to be fiscally conservative with government's money, but responsibly socially liberal when it comes to the social needs of Caymanians. And I think that that, that, is not, that is not impossible to do, Madam Speaker. But somewhere we in Cayman need to start to be more, as governments, more concerned and more involved in the social needs of the community, in, in particular those of our senior citizens. Because, Madam Speaker, all of us are going to eventually become senior citizens. The alternative to becoming a senior citizen, not a good one. It's six foot under, right? Um, and as far as I know, you don't need too many, too much help once you get down there. Eh? Nobody has ever come back and told me yet, but the way I look at it, I, I don't think you need too much. <clears throat> and Madam Speaker, while the government deserves recognition and praise for the financial improvements that it has brought about, equally so, Madam Speaker, it cannot escape blame and responsibility for the decay in social services to our community and the suffering of Caymanians, particularly our senior citizens and the less off in our, in our community. The, the, the middle class of which we were so proud is fast disappearing from the Cayman scene. Now, Madam Speaker, I know the government is going to get up and talk about what they have this in the budget, that in the budget. But, Madam Speaker, any government that budgets more for cats and dogs than young people needs cannot be accused of being socially responsible. Here, Madam Speaker, are numbers from the appropriation law. NGS 24, spaying and neutering cats and dogs. Six to four thousand eight hundred dollars. Remember that figure. Six to four thousand eight hundred dollars. NGS seven to two. Therapeutic services for young persons. Thirty-seven thousand five hundred. Roughly half. NGS forty-seven. Mentoring. Came on program. $9,025. TP44, Temporary Relief for Young Parents Program, $45,000. Uh, 
NGS 27, supervision of preschool children, 54,000. NGS 7 to 6, autism, diagnostics, and sexual trauma recovery program, for the $3,238. All of those services substantially less than the six to four thousand eight hundred you're going to spend to spay and neutering cats and dogs. You can't add them together because they're different programs. Well, I want you to explain the, the connection between oh I, I hope you will. But in the meantime, you're telling me that Autism, Diagnostics, and Sexual Trauma Recovery Program. I know put the budget together, you know, Madam Speaker. I know put the votes. I know put the, 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 the descriptions. I know put the amounts there. These are, the, these are the ministers responsible for these areas that did it, not even the Minister of Finance put them there. You will add them up. No, Madam Speaker, try as I may to determine from the budget what are the funds budgeted for senior services, for senior citizen services that deal with income replacement, health care, housing, social support. They remain dispersed across ministries and in all kinds of votes, making it very difficult to compile what these services cost and are cover and what they're for. And Madam Speaker, since they interrupted me and aggravated me, tell me that I tell you, but that as implying that what I say is not thing. One of the worst things in this country is what our senior citizens and less of people have to go through to get qualified as medical indigent. And the minister himself retains, it's been the three years, the authority to sign it off personally. And Madam Speaker, the problem with our social services Nobody can show you this is the application form, tick the boxes, and this is what you get. It depends on who you ask. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, speaker. again, I send people from my constituency to the needs assessment unit, and they turn them down. And I tell them, go ask somebody else to ask somebody. And they do that, they get everything. And that is why we can't clearly define what the requirements are to get the benefit and how much it is. Because it reduces their control over it. They can't tell you don't vote for Ezard because he can take this benefit I gave you away. Because you know what the qualification criteria is. And Madam Speaker, it's... Madam Speaker, on a point of order. Recognize the Honorable Minister for Children and Family Affairs. Please state your point of order. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, a member from Northside, would seeking to lead this House in the belief and the listening public that there is interference with the process for receiving assistance. Madam Speaker, it's for that exact reason why the people are screaming, because they don't get it how they used to get it. And this minister, for one, does not interfere with the process. The process is strict, and it's, yes, sometimes very difficult, but it is the process. And the department, the unit in charge, the needs assessment unit, is doing their utmost with the resources they have. Sometimes there are delays, and sometimes people simply don't qualify. But I take strong on bridge to the fact that he would improv 
uh, impute improper motive on my part or the ministries. Honorable member from the District of Northside, please ensure that as you um, debate and explain and expound upon your points that you do not impute on this particular minister that he has political interference as he's now stated for the record, that he has never before nor does he have an intention to political interfere. Madam Speaker, just for my own edification and for the listening public, could, you, could the minister please identify what standing order he's raising the matter under? Standing order 35-4, no member shall impute improper motives to another member was what my cognizance was of the minister's presentation. Well, Madam Speaker, just to clarify what I said, I said that the minister retains the right to sign off on these benefits. Madam Speaker, if that is not so, I apologize to the minister. The records of the Public Accounts Committee will show that his chief officer, his department heads in children and family services, and the head of his needs assessment unit told us so here that they can't decide it, only the minister can approve it. And I'm saying that that's wrong. If you want to get up and, 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 and claim that I was imputing in proper motives, that's not what it is, but that's the fact. If, he, if he's admitting that he interferes by telling some people they can't get it because he decides what a qualification is, then... Madam Speaker, the member knows... The Honorable Minister for Children and Family Services is a the point of elucidation or order. Yes, yes, ma'am. Member from North Star, will you give way to the minister? Madam Speaker. No, I Madam Speaker, he'll have his turn. He'll have his turn. If you got a point of order, raise it, identify it, and I'll sit down. Outside of that, get up and speak when you're ready. Honorable Minister, do you have a point of order, sir? Well, the point of order was that what he just said was not what I raised, what, what I got up on, because the law clearly states that. But the point of order was that he says that you can't get it done this way and you go this way and you get it done. And what he's doing there is imputing that they bypass the system and come to the minister. That was my in in interpretation. Member from Northside. Madam Speaker. The plight of our senior citizens should be beyond quality. There should be a proper published criteria for qualification for a specific benefit. If you meet the criteria, you get the benefit. If you don't meet the criteria, you don't get the benefit. It is time for this country to move. Whatever benefits we are going to offer to our senior citizens to that kind of system. You must be careful who you talk to at Kelly's bar. You was it. Madam Speaker, my point is this that our senior citizen deserves better. And although the governor in her throne speech in one sentence referred to the introduction of a national policy for older people, there is no mention for, of it in the premier's budget, what our title is again, Madam Speaker, budget policy statement. I fail to find the provisions in the budget for the implementation of the policy. I'll be quite willing to have the minister responsible get up and tell me what sections of the budget for the next 18 months, I remember it's an 18 month budget now, right? Has in it the provisions for the implementation of the national policy for older people. Because if it ain't in the budget, they ain't doing nothing about it for 18 months.
Madam Speaker, the current situation for senior citizens to access benefits from government and the myriad of problems as identified in the Auditor General's report on services to the needy is troubling, very troubling. All of this was painfully confirmed during the public hearings on the PSC. The public heard it. And when I present the report, trust me, I'm going to read it again. The acknowledged waste of resources, the complicated qualification process, the difficulty in accessing the services, the delays in decision making. The methodology of application all contained in that report and it is at the peril of our senior citizens that we continue to ignore it. They deserve better. Madam Speaker, my view, because one of the questions I asked the people who are doing this policy, national policy on older people, are you coming out to my community to talk to the senior citizens? No, no, no. You need to talk to them. Now, Madam Speaker, let me indulge me to digress from these two speeches for a short order. I need to set some political stuff straight. That's going on in my constituents in Northside. On the speaker, voters in Northside are being told by candidates for the UDP and for the PPM. I don't know whether they can. They, they no, can. Madam Speaker, let me let me let me say something, my friend. The UDP or the leader of the opposition, please state your point of order. Yes, Madam Speaker, I was, I, I, I was asking to make make some certain clarification. He's given way, Madam Speaker. The UDP has no candidate. In East End, North Side, we have one candidate in Bodentown confirmed, and we have two confirmed in Georgetown, and three confirmed in West Bay. Madam Speaker, if the member sees me anywhere, I'm all over. I'm supposed to be all over, but I have no candidates. Yeah, well, they want clean. They, they know that they know a good thing when they see they want to jump on it. A good bandwagon. <laughs> member from Northside. Oh, sorry. I, I, I do thank the member for giving giving way, Madam Speaker. Honorable Leader of, the, of sorry, Honorable Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I just also wish to say that or to assure the member from Northside that when the Progressives has a candidate for Northside, he will be the first to know. Honorable Member from Northside, I took it. At, you gave way. Madam Speaker, I want to thank the leader of the opposition as head of the UDP and the premier as leader of the PPM for denying the two that are going around now saying that they're candidates because they're not worthy to be on the candidates. I Member from Northside, I trust with your knowledge and experience you will quickly tie this into the throne speech to pause the statement of no. finance. Statement. Madam Speaker, that, that, I, I ask for your indulgence. If you don't give it to me, I will go back to the throne speech. But I ask specifically for your indulgence. 
Because the other lie they're telling people is that I am not running. And that I can't get nothing done with this government. But when they get elected with the government, which all one it is, the party, they can get all the things done. But let me put it to rest, Madam Speaker. I am running. I am running. I am running. And let me tell you something. Nobody can predict the results of elections. But I can tell you one thing. Honor God spent plenty of resources up to get that seat. Because it's going to be war. And Honor God beat me in every household living room. And the two people up in here that has experience in single member constituencies. None in two parties. <laughs> yeah. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, to the people on our side, there's a clear choice. Reasonable, educated individual, lots of experts in the political arena. Barely educated high school, zero experience in politics. Choice is clear for the people, but I respect whatever choice they make. Now, Madam Speaker, I want getting back now to the budget. I want to express my how really disappointed I am that the PPM candidate did not allow me the opportunity provided in the Constitution to come to cabinet and present the needs. The PPM candidate? Government, government, sorry, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, I can admit it on the count. Before they finalize the budget. But, Madam Speaker, I spent enough time in this house to know and understand the politics being played. And while they can get up here and deny those two candidates belong to neither party, I just want to lay out what I would have asked for had I got the opportunity and what I would be looking to make sure is in the Budget Bureau and Finance Committee. Get back to that same old, same old. Police presence, 24 7 and all that. Two additional classrooms for the primary school for computer and musical and arts room. Computer room at the Aidna Miles Northside Primary School, at the Aidna Miles Primary School, is smaller than the boys' bathroom. Smaller than the boys' bathroom. Or the girls' bathroom. I want the dock in Old Man Bay replaced. I've seen the paper today. He just did one little came on. EIU informs me that the maximum number of boats that may be using that is about 12 and that it costs about $70,000 to build it. That's all I have. I don't have an army, a whole civil service behind me to provide me information. All I have is the EIU. I could be wrong. There may be more than 12 boats in Del Cayman that on trailer. I don't know. But I believe that person that I call and ask how many was knows. Proper construction for, for the road for safety reasons. Chip and spray to Arlington Drive to preserve the work that they did last year in rebuilding the road. Repairs to William Medical Road. 200 foot extension to Galleon Close. Wall to stop the erosion of Kaibo Public Beach with the dock on top with. A motion was accepted by government a couple of weeks ago. I hope there is budget provision in there at least to do the design and the engineering and get the wall built. Access to the Clifton Hunter High School buildings 
for classes to be conducted by members of the community after hours at school. Bathroom facilities for public beach next to Starfish Point. Improvement at the junction of Old Robin Road, Frank Sound Road, and Northside Road for safety reasons. A very serious problem there in that in about it turning on to Old Robin Road has to be in the oncoming lane of traffic prior to making the turn. Additional resources for the Aidna Mile Primary School to improve the standards that were identified as being lower, including teachers, particularly for Spanish and for PE or sports. A half a day per week for PE at the school does not lead to healthy children. They need more than that. Continuation of repairs to the Kerdoki Bank Civic Center. There's a lot of work that needs to be done there. It's been a long time. The last time it was painted and whatnot, the community got together and painted it in 2010 in preparing it for the hurricane season. Madam Speaker, those are the things that I will look in to see if I can get some kind of commitment and allocation in the Budget Joint Finance Committee. <clears throat> now, Madam Speaker, let me return to this budget statement and the budget address and their shortcomings. The, prepare, the Premier, sorry, in his budget policy statement on pages 13 and 14, announced that the third amendment for the DART NRA agreement has been executed. Oh, Madam Speaker, if that was literally true and that agreement was really did, had really been executed. But I know what he means in the legal terms. He signed it. Now, Madam Speaker, the Premier... The Premier did promise at the start of those negotiations and several times when questioned as to how the negotiations were being progressed that the final agreement would be tabled. So I'm inviting the, the Premier to table it tomorrow morning. But why don't you give it to us before he speaks? We might need to speak on it too. I'll ask the Minister to, to table it tomorrow morning. No, no, I don't have to say about it. I don't know why you signed. I can't come down on what I haven't seen. I said enough about what was there before. But, Madam Speaker, the other side is that maybe the ministers and the Premier and his winding up can identify the one single project and all of these economic developments and opportunities that's ongoing that was initiated, started, and brought to fruition by their government. Madam Speaker, both the Premier and the Minister of Finance laud the introduction of the two-year budget page, page 15 in the Premier's and page 14 in the Minister of Finance. And on page 15, and I quote, the Premier said, in this respect, this is the first for our country. It sets in motion the government's plan to move toward two-year budgets, which will make the budget process more efficient, saving thousands of hours annually in budget preparation by civil servants and ministers. The Minister of Finance on page 14, says, the next phase will see the implementation of a multi-year budgeting which will come into effect in January 2018 
when the budget and appropriation bill will articulate appropriations to cover two financial years spanning 24 months. However, government agencies will be required to continue to produce annual audited accounts along with a performance report detailing their actual performance compared to their budget. There will also be an annual review process via the Finance Committee of the Legislative Assembly to allow an opportunity for legislators to review the government's budget. No, Madam Speaker, not being an accountant, not being an economist, not being an auditor. How are we, how is the two-year appropriation bill going to be laid out? Are we going to have separate years, figures approved, or is it going to be like this total 18 month, there's one figure? Because I think we have a problem with this 18 month in that I speak subject to correction, but I believe the accounting and auditor standards adopted by the public service require annual audits. So I don't know how we can break out the one year out of this 18 month thing to audit it on which six months we could do. But I think that is something that the government needs to address. <clears throat> because if, if you're saying that I have to produce audited accounts for the first year of a two year budget, and you say something is wrong, I simply tell you go fly a kite, I got a year to correct it. And are we going to do finance committee for the first year of the budget? That only, only that section of the, of the budget are we going to do in the finance committee in November, I would assume 2017. And then we can have another finance committee in November 2018 to do the second year 2019? Or are we going to have one finance committee in November 2017 that can do the whole two years? And if that's what we can do, and if the, if the civil servants will be preparing a two-year budget in the nine-month period that they normally do now, all of these savings and hours, what we can do, send them home on vacation every other year when the budget staff don't have nothing to do? Or are we going to simply reallocate them to do other functions in government? Because I would argue, Madam Speaker, that the one part of the PMFL law that worked really well from its inception has been the budgeting part. The budgets were normally done on time, et cetera, et cetera. But the accounting side was where the difficulty came in, and the auditing, and the actual performance. So I just need someone to explain to me how that is going to happen. Because, Madam Speaker, the records of the House will show that I voted against the two-year budget. I don't support it. And, Madam Speaker, I would, I would, I would caution that, remember, we got in this quagmire conundrum we're in with the PMFL law because somebody went to New Zealand to some conference and came back and thought it was a good thing. And we spent millions and millions of dollars implementing it. I'm hoping that the same thing here with this two-year budget because somebody went to Gorns or Jersey and come back and thought it was a good idea. So we're going ahead with it. Because I believe the annual reporting and the annual appropriation bill has worked well for this country. So, oh, Madam Speaker, the Premier and his budget policy statement and reflected in the budget lauds his government and their accomplishment, some of which are really, I mean, they, they are really laudable. They, I congratulate them for getting the 
new airport terminal started. The only question I would have is why is it necessary for government to contribute $7.5 million from general revenue to help fund the airport when there was a specific tax put on several years ago, I think it was 2008, and I think it has been recently increased, to fund airport development. Well, I would hazard a guess that if we, the $13 that was put on in 2008, if you multiply that by all the past years that been true, and that money was as it should have been, put in an escrow account, for the airport development, the funds would be there. And certainly, the increase just put on would certainly be sufficient to service any the borrowings that the airport authority would need to do it to complete the project and have the ability to service it without any government central revenue. Because, Madam Speaker, again, I believe that that 7.5 million is better spent on education. Because if the money isn't there, and it was put on for a specific purpose, and again, I think they may be in trouble with IAPA regulations, international regulations, if they put that tax on the traveling public and they, for that purpose, and they got IAPA approval, and they spent the money on something else, they have some difficulty. I don't know where the money has gone. But I believe in eight years that that $13 has been in place, a couple of hundred people went to the airport, you know. So if the funds are not there, I think the public owes an explanation of where the funds went. Madam Speaker, the government knows that I don't support the berthing for the cruise ships. The statistics that they come here and brag about with increasing cruise visitors can justify a $300 million expenditure on a pair in my books. Again, I would prefer to see that money spent on education. Madam Speaker, there is much in this budget for rich Caymanians and inward investors. There's much there for the protection of the status quo in the financial industry, but there's very little for the average working Caymanian. We have the review of the PR provisions in the immigration law to ensure non Caymanians can now stay, get Cayman status after permanent residence, and keep the jobs from qualified Caymanians. We're looking after them people. But Madam Speaker, where is the promised immigration reform that was promised to us in October 2013 that was supposed to come in January, February 2014, which was supposed to tighten up on work permits and, at, and other changes that needed to be made to benefit Caymanians? Madam Speaker, let me repeat what Ezra Miller's position is on this. You know. It's been that way from time we had Cayman Protection Law. The only way you should be able to get Cayman status is by marriage or descent. I don't think anybody should be able to come to my country as an economic migrant and get Cayman status because they made plenty of money. That's my personal position. Madam Speaker, when we are told from the economic statistics, as I said earlier, that some 30 plus percent of Caymanians with postgraduate qualifications are unemployed. God only knows how many of them are underemployed, not getting the job opportunities that they should have by virtue of their additional qualifications. When we have 29 percent unemployment in age 18 to 30, We have to be concerned.
Madam Speaker, where were the policies to drive legislation to provide advancement in careers, promotion opportunities for qualified Caymanians who are underemployed, to promote greater Caymanian ownership in the financial industry? The sustainability of the financial industry in Cayman over the long period requires Caymanian ownership. And we have to create the opportunities. There was a time when Caymanians owned it. We missed an opportunity last year when we did the new business licensing law. To remove that exemption for lawyers and doctors of not needing a business license and not having to have 60% Caymanian ownership. That exemption needs to be removed. There are Caymanians now who can, who can, who can take up the ownership in these, these institutions. They have the qualifications, they have the experience. Madam Speaker, where in these speeches is the policy and where is the financial commitment to improve education, to better prepare our Caymanians for the workplace? The government says education is a top priority. I need to be directed to the allocations in the budget that support that claim. Less than 10 million to work on John Gray High School. How much? And, and Madam Speaker, again, the country needs to accept that the, 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 there are growing needs this country needs at least two additional high schools. Government doesn't have to build them. But we need to put the policies in place that will allow other people to do it and government regulate them. None of that is addressed in here. We're going to need at least two, three primary schools. We, we, we see all of the difficulties, the problems at Savannah. Too many children in one spot. There was a time when Savannah was the number one primary school in this country. Everybody was knocking the door down trying to get their children to go there. They're going to need at least one if not two primary schools in the Borden Town, Savannah district. We're going to need another one for Eastern and Northside Zone within the next four or five years. Even if you give me the two rooms that I need under the Edna Mile now, that's just to accommodate what's there. But, Madam Speaker, we have to face these facts. And we have to establish priorities. And Madam Speaker, I get back to the song I've been singing for the last four years. We must, we must, we must, we must, this country must develop a comprehensive policy to drive appropriate legislation for our senior citizens. And it has to cover income replacement, has to cover health care coverage, has to cover housing, it has to cover social interaction. The, the fragmented stuff we have there now, the health insurance law, can't address it because we allow the companies to insure you until you're 60. Take all the money while you're healthy and so you get 60, then you might get sick to turn you down. And government says, oh, you pay me $5 per premium, or $10 per premium, $10 per family, and we go wrong. The pension legislation is hopelessly inadequate. And remain so even with the recent amendments. This policy, Madam Speaker, has to 
clearly articulate how a senior citizen qualifies for these benefits. It has to clearly articulate how does the government plan to pay for these essential services. And Madam Speaker, we have to tell the young working people that they're going to have to make a contribution of some sort to the care of their senior citizens. Every other country in the world does it. We seem quite comfortable and satisfied to say, well, we have a children's law, which we had in a law from the 70s, that we can prosecute the children for not looking after them. I mean, never prosecute anybody, but that's fine. Madam Speaker, on the short term, there has to be proper policy to drive appropriate legislation to provide for a transition from temporary welfare to employment. And ready to work in answer. We seems to be overjoyed. We got 33 people in that. And we got 2,000 people. 2,000 was on, on, on temporary supply at, at, at social services. Right. And, but the social services director tell us that they've not been asked if they have any people that should go in the ready to work program. You would think that that is the first choice government should, 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 should do. Is the people that they have there should be the very people that they are insuring. Because remember the government is proposing to pay the salaries of these people for the private sector to get their work for free, you know. With no guarantee or commitment that they have to employ the person after the government six months paying them for. Remember you have four minutes remaining. Madam Speaker, the time has come for this government. We can't wait for the next government. That's a year away. To address the needs of our senior citizens in this country. Madam Speaker, that is my final plea. I invite the government to set up a select committee of all members of parliament to look at the needs, the desires, the wants of our senior citizens. To bring them all in here to talk to us, all the stakeholders, all the technocrats, so that we can collectively decide with the assistance of our senior citizens who are going to be affected, what is the best program, what is the criteria to, to access it, and how we're going to fund it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Last call. Does any other member wish to speak? I recognize Honorable Deputy Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to offer my contribution to the 2016-17 budget. But Madam Speaker, before I begin, I'd like to congratulate the Governor, Her Excellency Mrs. Helen Kilpatrick, CB, on her throne speech, the Premier, the Honorable Alan McLaughlin, on his budget policy statement, delivering on our promises. And the Minister of Finance, Honorable Marco Archer, on his budget address, Securing Cayman's Future. Madam Speaker, it is three years since the people of the Cayman Islands afforded me the privilege and responsibility of providing stewardship over the ministries of district administration, tourism, and transport. 
and in particular oversight for the growth and development of the tourism portfolio in these islands. In my final budget address in this government's current term of office, I'd like to take this opportunity to review the progress that we have made. Madam Speaker, the challenges we have faced and outline the clear direction we have taken since 2013. Madam Speaker, I'm using 2013 as a benchmark because it is not my intention, the government's intention, to take credit for results or achievements that my team did not directly influence and therefore cannot justifiably claim. To accurately paint a picture of how far we have come, it is necessary to briefly recount where we were, particularly with respect to the tourism industry when we assumed responsibility for the Ministry of District Administration, Tourism and Transport. As this House may recall, Madam Speaker, when the progressives took over the reins of government, <coughs> concerns over a variety of issues and problems of economic mismanagement were widespread. Public confidence was at an all-time low. Dialogue with the UK was adversarial and unproductive. An interim government was appointed until the next election. And with respect to the tourism industry, while stayover arrivals had increased, cruise passenger arrivals were in decline. When this government came into in decline. Order. When this government came into power, bold promises were made to this country, Madam Speaker. We pledged to stabilize the economy, to restore trust and confidence in government, and to put our country back on a path towards sustainable growth and development so each Caymanian could benefit. Madam Speaker, we have delivered. By holding true to those commitments, confidence in the political leadership has been restored. The path to economic prosperity has been redefined, and we have returned our beloved Cayman Islands to a destination that is attractive to both visitors, investors, and Caymanians alike. But while the local economy is now more resilient, and better able to absorb external shocks and pressures, our financial services industry, the first pillar of our economy, is facing ex increased scrutiny. Global pressures are being felt more so now than ever before. The release of the Panama Papers has amplified calls for automatic sharing of beneficial information. Threats of blacklisting abound for noncompliance. Madam Speaker, we are very fortunate to have the Minister for Financial Services and the Councillor for Financial Services in place, supported by the Premier, constantly taking advantage of every opportunity to define the key features of our financial services model that address the inaccuracies that exist in international circles. Madam Speaker, the Minister for Financial Services recent presentation to the European Parliament's Tax E2 Committee on how the Cayman Islands financial services industry supports the global economy is an important example of his leadership. We also recall the Premier standing up, pointing out the American hypocrisy on beneficial ownership on the global stage. And as was noted in his budget statement, successful negotiations with the United Kingdom on beneficial ownership and a positive outcome at the anti-corruption summit are helping to provide clarity regarding our financial regime. As well as the various mechanisms through which Cayman collaborates with other countries on international tax matters. Madam Speaker, while this government is proactively tackling these issues, Concerns remain with the global pressure on our financial services. It is against this backdrop that it is critical to our economic well-being that the tourism sector, both stayover and cruise, continue 
to overperform. Since taking office, our policy has been to implement policies and programs that support, support sustained growth in stayover as well as cruise tourism. Both sectors remit vital contributions which help to keep the wheels of our economy turning. Madam Speaker, my budget address to this House in 2013, I outlined that the focus of my ministries would be centered on growing job opportunities and improving the quality of life for all Caymanians. Those priorities have not changed. The programs and policies implemented but my ministry continue to be evaluated against those same goals. Because at the end of the day, if the people of these islands are not benefiting from the work that we are doing, then who and what are we doing it for? Madam Speaker, because at the end of the day, if the people of these islands are not benefiting from the work that we are doing, then who and what are we doing it for? That is a thought that every member of this government has every morning as they wake up, Madam Speaker. As Tourism Minister, I'm extremely pleased with the strong growth and record-breaking arrivals that have re been registered between 2013 and today. Despite facing challenges beyond our control, such as storms that closed airports for weeks at a time, global health concerns such as Ebola and Zika viruses, stayover and cruise tourism have maintained impressive growth. Tourism, Madam Speaker, is the driver ensuring that other industries from retail to recreation are receiving more people through their doors, spending more money, improving bottom lines, generating profits and creating jobs and creating jobs. Madam Speaker, the total visitor arrivals at the end of 2013 was 1,700,000. It was broken down with air arrivals at 345,000 and cruise arrivals at 1,300,000. In 2014, the total was 1,992,000, very close to 2 million. The air arrivals were 382,000, and the cruise arrivals were 1.6 million. At the end of 2015, the total arrivals was 2,100,000, approximately, broken down with cruise arrivals at 1.7 million, and air arrivals at 385,378. 2013, the highest recorded since 2001. I want to make sure you hear that, Madam Speaker, because I'm not comparing this to a slow season or a down year to show growth. This is being compared to 2001. To briefly recap, the arrivals in 2013 were the highest recorded since 2001 and were 7.4% higher than 2012. In 2014, visitation continued to soar and several months exceeded their highest on record in 14 years. In 14 years, Madam Speaker. Visitor arrivals topped 382,000, which represented an 11% increase over the previous year, which was already up 7%. This was more than double the regional average, Madam Speaker. And in terms of actual numbers, 2014 arrivals exceeded 2013 by approximately 37,000 visitors. So the best year we'd had, the next year exceeded it again. Rounding out the year unprecedented increases, Cayman Airways transported a record setting 412,546 passengers, an increase of 25,000 passengers over the year before, which was a record breaking year. All areas of the airline's core operational areas saw increases in 2014, including the strategic services purchased by the Cayman Island government for tourism routes. Madam Speaker, while 2014 was a remarkable year, 
in terms of visitation and growth in tourist arrivals. The story of 2015 was even more impressive. Stayover arrivals exceeded 385,000, our highest in recorded history. Our highest in recorded history. Oh, he laughed. Arrivals in March exceeded 45,000, making it the highest record-breaking month in the history of Cayman's tourism. So you see, Madam Speaker, we're not comparing this to numbers that were down before that we show a rise. We're comparing this to the best numbers that Cayman ever had, and we have topped those numbers. Six out of the 12 months in 2015, namely January, February, March, April, August, and November, were the best ever in our recorded history. And you'll note the month of August, which is typically considered slow season, was included among the record breakers. Madam Speaker, to speak on cruise passenger arrivals in 2013 was just over 1.3 million. Admittedly, this represented a decrease of 8.72% over 2012. But due to a coordinated effort between the government and our cruise partners, passenger arrivals jumped to 1.6 million in 2014. Before that, in 2012, it was 1.3 million. This translated into increase of 17 percent over 2013, or 233,000 more passengers. Madam Speaker, for 2015, the target was increased again to 1.7 million passengers, and by year end, the numbers did not disappoint. Not only was the goal met, it was exceeded by more than 16,000 passengers, making it our highest year in total in 20 years. Tourism arrival statistics are generally viewed as a barometer of the industry's success and your country's economic well-being. Perhaps a more illustrative indicator of tourism performance, Madam Speaker, is its contribution to the Cayman economy. See, Madam Speaker, our thought as a government is we have to move forward. We have to grow this country. We have to create opportunities. We have to put skill sets in place. And one of the tools that we have to do this is with our tourism product. As I go through my remarks today, you'll see there's a thread talking about how we take advantage of building an industry, empowering our people, and growing our economic well-being. Between 2013 and 2015, stay over visitation increased by 40,000 year over year, and cruise arrivals increased by 341,000, making a combined increase of 381,000 more visitors arriving year over year. This combined increase, Madam Speaker, contributed to a direct spend increase of $88,698,000. Madam Speaker, that's a one-year direct increase because of the growth in tourism put into the economy of the Cayman Islands. And it breaks down in how we have approached this in a balanced way. 40,000 stayover visitors, they have an average stay of 6.76 days. And in those days that they stay, excluding airfare, they spend approximately $183. This broke down to approximately $50 million of spend for stayover. And at the same time, Madam Speaker, in year 2015, the increase of 341,000 cruise visitors with an increased spend to $115 per day broke down to approximately $40 million, reaching two different economic areas of employment and job creation. Approximately $90 million was the growth between 2013 in and the year of ending 2015. One year increase 
direct spend, $90 million. Madam Speaker, these increases are reflected in the tourism accommodation tax, which have grown year on year, making a greater contribution as well to the government coffers. The tourism accommodation tax collection for calendar year 2013 was $15.4 million. For 2014, government collected $19.8 million, an increase of 28%. And in 2015, the accommodation tax amounted to $20,800,000, representing 5% increase. Madam Speaker, comparing apples to apples between 2013 and 2015, the increase in stay over arrivals of 40,000 visitors resulted in a 34.87% increase in accommodation tax received by government. This significant level of growth is the result of increases in three key areas. An increase in the room rates, compounded by an increase in stayover arrivals, compounded by an increase in the tourism accommodation tax itself. With respect to government taxes collected from cruise ship, Madam Speaker, passengers, the government collects $6 for passenger, which contributed an additional $2 million to the Port Authority's bottom line with the increase of 341,000 cruise passengers. Madam Speaker, I think the point here is the balance in stayover and cruise that we continue to work hard to, to develop and take advantage of both the opportunities. The impressive growth in tourism arrivals didn't happen by accident, Madam Speaker. Rather, this success is the result of careful planning, decisive action, and it is due to the proactive efforts of the Ministry, working together with the Department of Tourism, Cayman Airways, private sector, Cayman Island Airport Authority, and all the other tools available to us, immigration, customs, in a positive way to win as much sustainable tourism business for our islands as possible. I've said, Madam Speaker, many times that there's no magic formula to drive visitation to the islands. There's not a one-size-fits-all solution that automatically brings growth. Rather, it takes a sound understanding of the opportunities and challenges and a willingness to do something about it. Very early in our term of office, we forecast the need for additional accommodations to keep pace with increased arrivals. Madam Speaker, we currently have a total of 5,449 rooms. We are at maximum capacity in our season, which means that we have no more space on the island for people to arrive by plane, Madam Speaker, we have no ability to increase the number of people when all the rooms are full. So that is the strategy that we've talked about moving into the shoulder season and when we have slower times of the year to point in the direction of bringing people to increase stayover visitation. Madam Speaker, if the infrastructure itself does not keep pace with growth in arrivals, the investment made to market our islands will be wasted. And that's why we continue to work with partners to develop more investment in the room sector itself. Madam Speaker, the government is not in the business of building hotels. But we recognize that a successful tourism industry is a powerful stimulus for development. We therefore pledged to create a more welcoming and lucrative business environment to encourage investors to choose the Cayman Islands. And yes, Madam Speaker, my good friend from the North Side gave us an oration earlier today about giving incentives and taxation and how it works and how the trickle down works. But I think there's one part of the formula that needs a little more explanation. Madam Speaker, he is absolutely correct that we don't have income tax. 
We don't have property tax. Madam Speaker, what we do have is consumption tax. And how the industry works and how growth works is the responsibility of a government is to look at the opportunity to grow their country, to give benefit to each of their citizens for education, health, employment. Madam Speaker, that is the opportunity that this government looks at to see when we find what we believe is a very positive developer that has a development that coordinates with what we are trying to accomplish here that adds balance to where we want more economic well-being. Example being St. James Point in Baden Town, which does not have a five-star resort in it and certainly has a population base that is looking forward to the new jobs and the new opportunities that will be created. But the way the government derives its income from that, Madam Speaker, is the government gets a tax, an import duty, on everything that is consumed and everything that is brought in. So the activity that creates jobs, the activity that brings more people in, and I can say it simply that if you provide an incentive to bring in 10,000 visitors, tourist visitors a year that spend $200 a day, that money is what trickles down into the economy and creates what it takes for the government to operate and creates the tax base that we operate from. And Madam Speaker, if we never give an incentive and we never work with the developer, and we never work, whether it's local or foreign. Finn is Caymanians building that now, right here in Georgetown. Opportunity for Caymanian businessmen. If we don't work with them, if we don't give them incentive, if we don't create a growth in our economy, the government will never get any new revenue. That's how consumption tax works. So that's, that is why consideration for incentives is given. That's why in certain areas we're more aware and more willing and more interested in giving different types of concessions. And that's why we continue to look at opportunities of how we can move forward. This government was the first government that was approached by the Howard Group to do Margaritaville Hotel. This government worked with them. They worked with them with some incentives, and that is under construction. 90 rooms are to be opened by December. Madam Speaker, <coughs> if we hadn't done that, the jobs for the 90 rooms wouldn't have been created, the trickle-down effect wouldn't have been created, and the government revenue that spills out into all the necessary functions of government would not be available. So that's the growth part of it. Madam Speaker, existing hotels have expanded their operations and new hotel properties are in the pipeline for development. By 2019, these sizable capital investments will boost our accommodations capacity by 20% and provide jobs and growth opportunities for the tourism industry over the short, medium, and long term. To give this honorable house an idea of the scale of these hotel developments. They will include the Kimpton Seafire Resort and Spa. In November 2016, Kimpton will open, will unveil its first Caribbean resort. It will be along Seven Mile Beach. This boutique property offers 266 guest rooms and 62 residential suites, along with a spa, restaurants, and retail promenade. I have no hesitation, Madam Speaker, in saying that this resort, once open, will provide guests with a premier resort experience. St. James Point, as mentioned, is in the Beach Bay, Baden Town area, Madam Speaker. It's built to be a five-star. I think everybody in this honorable house knows about it. It's a $250 million luxury resort. And it's a multi-use property which will feature 200 rooms 
and more than 90 residential units, in addition to several restaurants and spa. Madam Speaker, the diversification of our tourism product takes a major leap. For golf enthusiasts, as we try to move in to that type of, of tourism, golf tourism, the destination in 2018, the Arnold Palmer, in conjunction with the Ironwood Cayman, has announced the development of a PGA Championship golf course and resort, which will be designed by Arnold Palmer himself. The plans for this are now at the planning department, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, we know of the success of Health City. It continues to progress in its plans, and it is now on track to build a 185-room hotel that will further enhance the destination of healthcare in the Cayman Islands. The development plans around Healthcare City include a new supermarket, bank, gas station, pharmacy, and restaurant in that area. Two very strong projects, three very strong projects for the Eastern District, Madam Speaker. Again, you show how incentives can move development in certain areas. I mentioned the Treasure Island Resort earlier this year. The Howard Hospitality Group acquired the Treasure Island Resort. The property is now undergoing a major transformation and will rebrand the Margaritaville Resort. It is expected to put 90 rooms on the market in December of 2016. Total, Madam Speaker, the resort will feature 280 guest rooms, spa, and a two-story water slide <coughs> with a family theme. Madam Speaker, the DART group have revealed plans to construct a five-star hotel along Seven Mile Beach Corridor. The international brand is not yet known or announced, but we can safely assume that the addition of another five-star property in the Cayman Islands will lift our tourism accommodation product to new heights. The old Hyatt Resort, Madam Speaker, the DART Group also recently acquired it, which has been standing derelict for over a decade. No indication has been provided as yet regarding future plans or potential number of rooms. But suffice it to say that we would expect the opportunity there is for it to be added to our tourism product, hopefully with a, a golf theme and a four or five star flag flying on it. As well as adding hundreds of millions of dollars into our economy, Madam Speaker, these projects are an indication of the level of confidence investors have in this government and this jurisdiction. And it's twofold, Madam Speaker, because the construction industry itself is the group that benefits initially. But after it's completed, the business of tourism that is really our export, the people that come here bring foreign cash here. So it's just as if we had some type of valuable asset that we could export, some type of natural resource that we could export, we would expect to get cash in for it. Our export is really our tourism market itself and the people that come here to spend the money. So it's, it's an investment that continues to pay after the construction is over of it, after the construction has been finished, then it continues to pay in and create opportunity for the Caymanian people. When they see infrastructure projects like the redevelopment of Owen Roberts International Airport, which has been taken, talked about for over a decade, and the revitalization of Georgetown actually happening because this government made a commitment to that effect, investors are reassured that government is keeping its word. It is following international best practice. That is the kind of business environment investors look for and invest in. And Madam Speaker, Owen Roberts International Airport, it has been talked about for a long time. And I think that, that one of the reasons it could never get started was because there were always reasons that people would say, 
why it couldn't get started. What we faced was a desperate need for an airport to be grown to the point of our arrivals and departures, but the fact that we had difficulty arranging the financing for it. So when we put the budget of $55 million on it, Madam Speaker, that's what we knew that we could get, servicing it through the fees that are paid by the passengers that go through and working with cash flow. And we were able to move forward with it. And I think that today, maybe because of the cash situation the government is in and the prudent management of the country, as we have done, we might have looked at it in a little different way. But we would be a year and a half behind in trying to get started on it. So another term of government would have gone without starting on that airport. Madam Speaker, from an industry standpoint, new hotels and international brands will add interest and diversity to our product base. This in turn will expand our ability to market a high-end cosmopolitan and sophisticated tourism product. It is worth noting that increased visitor arrivals are also encouraging the development of small locally owned boutique properties, guest houses, businesses, restaurants, tour operators, as well as attractions such as the recently opened Crystal Caves in the district of Northside. Madam Speaker, in the new sharing environment that has moved into the tourism industry, you see TripAdvisor, you see Airbnb, you see Vacation Rental by Owner, VRBO. What these do is allow people to compete and become involved in the tourism industry for a very low threshold. And the example is that if you have a small property and it's a two bedroom and you get it licensed, you can advertise it and you can put guests in it once it's licensed by the Department of Tourism. Further to that, Airbnb is actually going to where you can rent an individual room. So Madam Speaker, the command that you and I know is so well in tune to take advantage of this opportunity because of our connectivity with the outside world, because of our global experience, because of the friendliest people in the world. You see this growing faster and you see local participation in this that brings people back as stayover visitors over and over and over. You and I both know that in our constituency, that is the fastest growing sector for private villas owned by private individuals who are taking advantage of each of these opportunities. And I'm safe to say that it is also blooming and blossoming in every other district in Cayman. These are the kind of opportunities, Madam Speaker, that we create with infrastructure, that we create with a proper airport, that we create with proper airlift. And these, when you see the numbers, and you see the proof, you understand that what this government is doing, it's delivering and working for us, the people. Looking ahead, Madam Speaker, with all of that as the backdrop, you will see that in the 2016-17 budget, which the government presented today, today, is designed to build an encouraging tourism performance that has been recorded between 2013 and present. In a global environment where tourism dollars are hotly contested for, maintaining our competitive position means marketing to travelers in a way that stands out in an overcrowded international marketplace. I think before I explain as simple as I could of how you and I could participate. What we do from the Department of Tourism aspect in the marketing, we really drill down in a more overarching way to make sure that name recognition and, and the opportunity that when people here came in, they want to find out a little bit more 
about it. We have a yield-driven approach adopted to ensure that as much of our marketing spend as possible translate into increased arrivals. This method is strategic, Madam Speaker. It's targeted and measured and places the traveler at the center of the marketing initiative. Market intelligence capabilities have also been enhanced so that more informed decisions can be made about our target demographic. Having identified level of home income required to visit and really enjoy the Cayman Islands, what the Cayman Islands has to offer, we can be assured our promotional efforts are reaching the right market. Even so, marketing tactics are continually being revived and reviewed and sharpened to deliver the right message at the right time to the right audience to drive demand for travel to the Cayman Islands. Even in the face of outstanding results, the Ministry and Department of Tourism are working hard to capitalize on top of mind awareness being generated and we are working even harder to convert that awareness into sales and revenue. Top of mind, Madam Speaker, goes to when we, as a destination, put our name out in front that when somebody mentions a key word or an area, if they mention Caribbean, what's on the top of your mind is Cayman. If they mention blue water, what is on the top of your mind is the Cayman Islands. If they mention Cuba, we want top of mind because they associate it with the Caribbean basin, top of mind, we want Cayman Islands to be recognized in that same wording and thought. And that is, that is the issue and the push of our holistic um, name recognition. For example, Madam Speaker, according to IRR, which is Integra Realty Resources, Caribbean's marketplace for 2016, for the first three quarters of 2015, the average daily rate, ADR, in Cayman increased by 14.3 percent to 300 and $64. Madam Speaker, that speaks to when there are no rooms available and you have over demand, the price goes up. So we feel very comfortable as we add new rooms, they will also have the number of people that are needed to give them the occupancy to be successful. It brings us back in line to where we were before the financial crisis, that price, Madam Speaker. Cayman okay, has the highest ADR of any destination in the Caribbean. And again, that shows the need for more rooms. It's the second highest, the second highest in the Caribbean is the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the third is Barbados. Madam Speaker, in terms of where we are today, because this government continues to create the right kind of environment, our industry partners and businesses to be successful, 2016 promises to be another solid year of growth. This means more jobs for our people, more business opportunities, small business and tour operators and taxi, and more revenue for our economy. Madam Speaker, we pledge to the people of this country that our multifaceted approach to stabilize, stimulate, and grow the economy would result in more jobs, and it has. What do we see on the horizon? Over the next few years, we see tremendous opportunity ahead, Madam Speaker. We see a bright light for this country. Managing that growth opportunity means striking the right balance between marketing, airlift, Room stock, attractions, transport, managing the customer experience, building repeat guests. And this is being accomplished, Madam Speaker, through different channels. Over the next three years, the Cayman Island Department of Tourism, for example, 
and looking at new business development opportunities in the Midwest, in the West Coast of the United States, Canada, and Latin America. The DOT continues to work closely with Cayman Airways and other partners in Lyft, providing support and direction through research, marketing, and route development. The new tourism properties, Kempton and Margaritaville, are being introduced as we stand here and speak to markets to drive demand ahead of their opening. Madam Speaker, the Department of Tourism is also helping to create private sector industry opportunities to deepen tourism and travel business knowledge. For example, with TripAdvisor, Search Engine, Optimism, and Destination Weddings and Honeymoon Workshops. The information, Madam Speaker, that is available as a very quick example, if you mine the information of people that use a MasterCard, you will find that they usually purchase an airplane ticket to go on vacation on Tuesdays. So that is the, the point that we drill down to know that we need to put ads in specific areas on Mondays to make sure that they have that opportunity on Tuesday to buy the ticket to come to the Cayman Islands, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the development of new infrastructure is also a key part of that equation because more growth places more demand on infrastructure. 20% growth in room stock, Madam Speaker. Good problem, more demand. A good example of this, Madam Speaker, is the redevelopment of Georgetown. We can all see that the Georgetown Revitalization Program is moving forward with the new roads and new business opportunities. Madam Speaker, I take this opportunity to thank the Minister of Planning for leading that initiative and moving it forward as we drive on the new roads and see the new opportunities. Madam Speaker, prior to taking office, the PPM party pledged in our manifesto that we would seek to renegotiate aspects of the 4 Cayman Investment Alliance Agreement that had been entered into by the previous administration with the Dark Group. In our view, Madam Speaker, the agreement set precedents that created an unlevel playing field for existing tourism stakeholders. On that basis, we sought to re-examine the deal and derive an outcome that was not only more equitable, but also more beneficial to the people of the Cayman Islands. As the Premier noted, Madam Speaker, the Third Amendment, the DART-NRA agreement, is now signed. This revised agreement removes the controversial room tax concession, which was one of the major bones of contention for the tourism industry. In addition, it commits the DART organization to completing roadworks, such as the construction of two additional lanes along the East Fleet Tibbets Highway, along the approach to Caymana Bay. Madam Speaker, the DART group of companies has made a significant investment in the Cayman Islands over the years. Their long-term plans include development of at least two more hotels along Seven Mile Beach corridor. Caymana Bay is expanding and will benefit from several million dollars of additional investment. Based on these few examples, Madam Speaker, DART's financial strength is clearly evident, but so too is the company's commitment to these islands. I believe the country can be satisfied that the new terms are more even-handed. I thank all parties involved for their hard work throughout this consultation process, and I believe that we understand that it has to be a balance as the largest investor in our country. We have to make sure that it's balanced for the people of the Cayman Islands and for them as a business entity, and we understand that, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we breached, briefly touched on Owen Roberts International Airport. I'd like to talk a little bit about the redevelopment and the airport expansion. While the increase in passenger arrivals 
interim improvements at the Owen Roberts International Airport were put into effect to ease congestion while the redevelopment takes place. I think that each one of us, as we think back to the start of 2013 and what we faced as the season came upon us at Owen Roberts International Airport, will agree that the emergency works that were done there as quickly as possible until the redevelopment could start have been as successful as they could possibly be. The covered walkway, which was installed airside along the apron length, to protect passengers from sun and rain. A temporary departure area consisting of steel frame structure designed for airport use. The new departure hall adds 3,600 square feet, Madam Speaker, of extra space. It accommodates 230 passengers and is equipped with four restrooms. Air conditioning and a PA system, and it additionally provides Owen Roberts International Airport with eight departure gates, one for each parking on the apron, and has significantly reduced the congestion experienced at peak travel times. Could it be better? We all wish it could be better, Madam Speaker, but I think that we all have to agree it has certainly got much better in the last two years. An in-transit area was also constructed enabling passengers to be screened and processed separately from stayover passengers arriving into Grand Cayman. Having the ability to process passengers in separate areas greatly improved efficiency. The wait time in the main hall has been reduced. The arrivals and processing experience has been significantly improved for travelers with the addition as well of a third lane there for the hand baggage checks going in. Additional border control officers were added to process arriving passengers more timely and reduce the overspill that backs up outside the arrivals hall building. Custom officers also work to process more passengers during peak time by adjusting their scheduling and the number of officers there, Madam Speaker. And we always say a big thank you to the uniform branch out there, all the work they've done to, to help move that forward as we wait for the new bricks and mortar. A passenger concierge service was also established, Madam Speaker, to provide a seamless transition for passengers willing to pay for expedited service and also to help medical patients um, and our medical tourism in more than Health City, but other providers of medical tourism. I can tell you that Health City does take advantage of it. Well, these are just some of the temporary solutions, Madam Speaker, to provide more comfort to passengers. I'm pleased to note that the progress continues to be made with respect to the redevelopment and expansion project itself. Phase one broke ground in September of last year. It will be completed on time and on budget. Phase two, contract for phase two worth $42.5 million was just signed with McAlpine and will include the renovation and expansion of arrival area, departure lounge, check-in lobby, and other areas. The work will be carried out in several sub-phases so that the terminal can remain fully functional, safe, and secure throughout the construction period. The entire project, Madam Speaker, will be completed summer of 2018. And I think that if we look at phase one and the size of phase one, and realize that that was a $3 million project, part of the phasing, the $42 million second phase can be expected to show a much larger footprint than we're used to seeing there at this time. Madam Speaker, the 20% growth in a short period of time, hotel rooms, opportunities that, that came up are what we would call trigger events, um, triggers that make us look at our airport itself. In addition to the redevelopment, discussions are also taking place to see how best the airport's runway can be extended. Longer runway, Madam Speaker, would be better able to accommodate different aircraft and loads and opens up opportunities for more long haul flights from various gateways, such as West Coast, the US, 
Canada, LA, Seattle, Calgary, into South America, um, and opportunities as we get different brand hotels that look at that market. And we go back, Madam Speaker, when we talked about marketing, airlift, hotel rooms, attractions, transport, when you give the opportunity for longer haul aircraft or other areas to move away from your core market, you provide the infrastructure that's needed and the look at having a longer runway gives the infrastructure that's needed for expansion into these areas and more success into some of the new brands that may be stronger in those areas. The West Coast and Midwest United States are important growth markets that we are looking to expand to. The Department of Tourism will be looking at developing a capacity management plan and further decisions will be made once this assessment has been completed. While on the subject of infrastructural developments, Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to provide an update on a cruise berthing facility. And I want to just take one minute to, to say that a cruise berthing facility is like a highway. Our cruise berthing proposals do not have upland development. You don't have any intrusion into markets that are already established. We are trying to create opportunity in the redevelopment of Georgetown where more Caymanian-owned businesses can become more involved in the tourism of cruise passengers. But if you look at the ship itself, in the same way that you have to get from Georgetown to Turtle Farm, in the easiest possible way, you want to arrive on a ship and you want to get over the dock or over the water to get to the island to enjoy the attractions. Because remember, the largest percentage of arrivals leave Georgetown. When you go down on a day with cruise ships, which is most days, when you see the buses going to West Bay, going to the Eastern Districts, you realize that we have to make it easier for cruise arrivals to get here. So, so this is an infrastructure demand that gives opportunity for every one of the attractions that are located all over these islands. And as we get them over the dock in a faster, speedier way, saving time, it gives them the ability to go farther east and farther north and give opportunity to more small businesses that are dependent on tourism. A strategic outline case, Madam Speaker, was started by the last government. The strategic case had to be done because of anything project over $10 million. The strategic case started by the last government, Madam Speaker, said that we should proceed to the outline business case. PricewaterhouseCoopers on an open tender was chosen. It had completed, the business case itself was completed in the fourth quarter of last year. And that report concluded that the estimated economic benefit to be derived from the peers exceeded the environmental costs associated with the damage to the environment of the reef. Notwithstanding that, Madam Speaker, the Cayman Islands government agreed to have the pier designs reviewed to identify a more environmentally friendly outcome, if possible, such as moving the piers to deeper water, turning piers different degrees, minimizing the dredging. Throughout this entire process, Madam Speaker, Government's overarching objective has been to arrive at an outcome that will deliver maximum economic benefit to the people of the Cayman Islands with the least environmental impact to the Georgetown Harbor. Consequently, government agreed to rework the designs for the cruise ship piers. Conceptually, 
the rework designs indicate that it is possible to have less dredging and to move the piers into deeper water. So, Madam Speaker, on that information, the government, led by the Public Works Department, carried out a pre-qualification tender to hire a civil engineering group, group to look at what the new design would entail and what the costs of the new design would be. This resulted in four companies becoming pre-qualified, the RFP for the civil engineering design work was subsequently issued in May and is expected to be back and the design group appointed in the middle of June. In the meantime, the Ministry of Tourism has been in discussions with the cruise industry partners to arrive at a funding model that will deliver the best possible outcome for the country. The Ministry will report the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and Cabinet once this model has been achieved. Madam Speaker, in response to those who believe the piers are unnecessary, that we should be mindful that today's cruise passenger is usually a percentage of tomorrow's stayover guests. We as a government have had an open and transparent process. We have tried to gather as much information as possibly available to make an informed decision. We own all of the intellectual property, the environmental impact assessment belongs to the people of the Cayman Islands. The decision will be made on information provided us through best practice and through globally, globally recognized firms and experts in every field that we've had to hire. I don't really know, Madam Speaker, if there is any other way that this government could have approached this to make sure that we have as much information to make the best informed decision we can for this country. Madam Speaker, in saying that, I can assure you that the government is aware that the pursuit of cruise tourism should not be at the expense of stayover visitors. Rather, we are working towards achieving a balance for two sectors to coexist and to benefit all that depend on both areas for work and a livelihood. We believe that constructing cruise berthing piers will provide, let me say this, Madam Speaker, provide a great economic benefit and will help our island maintain our competitiveness as a cruise port destination. We'll also provide other opportunities, and I'm optimistic that Cayman's proximity to Cuba will create mutually beneficial opportunities for our islands to be included in the Western Caribbean itineraries as Cuba opens more and more, and we see it on a daily basis for the cruise industry. This would be a desirable option for cruise lines to pursue. And Madam Speaker, the cruise berthing facility will put us on a level playing field with our competitors to the south, to the north, to the west, and to the east. And we'll be on a level playing field when the new routes are being considered in the boardrooms of the cruise lines. Madam Speaker, as Cuba is a new destination, cruise passengers will be more inclined to overlook the inconvenience that comes from not having peers in order to experience the destination. But they're unlikely to accept an itinerary that continues to include two or three ports back to back where tenders are the only means of disembarkation. It is also worth noting, Madam Speaker, the cruise berthing project will not only help safeguard our vital cruise business, but it will also give us the ability to expand the cargo port, which is long overdue. The current configuration of the port, Madam Speaker, is severely limited at present. Our cargo facilities are essentially constrained on both sides by cruise operations, Royal Watler and North Terminal. The 
port's capacity to grow to meet increasing demand for cargo and aggregate will be exhausted within a few years at the growth rate we now show. If we do not take the opportunity to remedy this situation, Madam Speaker, while the cruise piers are being constructed, will therefore is a unique opportunity for us to take advantage of. Therefore, makes most logical and financial <coughs> sense to address both needs in tandem. Madam Speaker, it's clearly evident that government continues to take bold steps to position tourism as a cornerstone of economic growth and job creation. And for good reason, increasing visitation translates into the delivery of greater economic benefits for the wider cross-section of people. The knock-on effect multiplies throughout the community, creating jobs and entrepreneurial opportunities for Caymanians. More visitation means more taxis and tour operators in a sector reserved for Caymanians. The ministry has issued more than 65 taxi licenses and looks at more as the season comes on. More crafts and souvenirs being sold. More hotels and restaurants operating at capacity. This fuels the needs for more hotels and infrastructure, leading to more inward investment coming into the country. Madam Speaker, topical issue of the day has been beach vending. More visitation, the success of this government in driving the growth in the tourism industry places stress on some of our public areas, such as beaches, during times when higher numbers of people are using the same area at the same time. Madam Speaker, I've been the Minister of Tourism for three years. I can't say that this problem wasn't here when I got elected. But I can say nothing was being done about it when I got elected. And we have done everything we could to try to, to create the craft market um, by the cricket grounds to give more kiosks in more areas, craft market itself, of how we could expand that to try to, to not displace any of the vendors. But, Madam Speaker, the subject of beach vending, particularly on public beach, has become an issue of late, and complaints have been received by the Ministry of too many not pleasant experiences there between the vendors and whether it be Caymanians or visitors on the beach. To put this into a proper context, Madam Speaker, the problems surrounding vending at Public Beach are multifaceted and have arisen and escalated largely because of unprecedented growth and because of an opportunity there that we want to make sure vendors can take advantage of. The Ministry is aware of the issues and we're working on implementing solutions. An intra-ministerial committee led by Ministry, DAT, District Admin, Tourism and Transport, including the Department of Commerce and Investment, the Ministry of Planning, Police and Immigration has been established and the team is collaborating to manage the issues as we speak, Madam Speaker. The Ministry has taken a balanced approach whereby the needs and expectations of our visitors are balanced and our local Caymanians against the needs of the vendors. Rather than disenfranchising the vendors who depend on this sale to support their families, our objective is to ensure that vendors who are properly licensed and in accordance with the law are empowered to provide the best experience possible to our guests. And Madam Speaker, we're, we are happy to work with them. Um, Pride program, there's a lot of programs out there that we've made sure that they know about. With this objective in mind, we're working with all of the relative agencies to find the right balance. This morning I spoke to Minister of Planning to talk about one of the, the areas that we, we had to understand how we can actually allow the vendor themselves to use government property before the proper legislation. And, and it's just that inter 
ministerial communication that is working to get this resolved as quickly as possible and in the right way for all concerned. Madam Speaker, I made it clear when I started that this government did not expect to take credit for anything that we came and found. I have said many times that we found a foundation, a groundwork of a hospitality study school. And we believed that, that was something that was needed and needed as quickly as possible. The Ministry of Debt remains committed to encouraging that young Caymanians pursue a promising career and opportunities in tourism. And as speaker, we pledge to provide a hospitality school for Caymanians to become trained, qualified. I'm very pleased to say, Madam Speaker, that we've delivered that and we're now going into our second year that we will have young Caymanians coming out. And our events immensely pleased with the success. During the 2014-15 academic year, 26 students registered for the program. 18 completed the city and guilds certificate. Five completed UCCI hospitality certification of those students. Twelve had confirmed jobs in the industry. Nine are still employed. Five others are pursuing higher education. That was the first year, Madam Speaker. That was the start. We made sure that parents and guardians were involved in every social meeting um, event that took place. We wanted to make sure that entry levels had no barriers in front of them, and we made sure the funding was in place, that whatever they needed from a scholarship standpoint was available to them. And Madam Speaker, there's no better day to spend than to go down to the hospitality school for a couple hours and see those young people, whether they're talking about food and beverage, um, front desk, but to see the enthusiasm and the excitement. And then experience Councillor Hugh and I have had is after they've actually graduated to see them in the work environment and, and see them working and, and the enthusiasm and the excitement they have for their job. And every one of them that we talked to talked about how they're going to continue their education, what's available to them. In 2015-16, Madam Speaker, 28 students enrolled in the program. 23 are current, there are 18 students on rotation to the industry. The other students that are not on rotation are currently being groomed for the industry and will be on rotation soon. The School of Hospitality Studies is proving to be a viable stepping stone for assisting young Caymanians to get a foot in the door of the hospitality industry. Armed with an internationally accepted qualification, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I want to mention the Minister of Education. She has been involved with this. Thank her for her help with this. And, and what we have found is that the partnership with the private sector, including CETA, Ministry of Education, Tourism, Department, Ministry of Tourism has provided a hybrid model for a very, very successful vocational school. Never let it be said that a young person in Cayman cannot get the proper training or the skill set that they need to get into the tourism industry. And Madam Speaker, we all, and I, I think I can speak for everyone in this chamber, including yourself, Madam Speaker, we all want great success for the young people of this island. And we understand that we have to provide the education, we have to provide the skill sets that they may need. And I will move to say that if somebody that is not a young person comes and wants to take this course, they will be welcomed that we can retrain and reintroduce them into a very exciting field of employment and career opportunity. Because remember, Madam Speaker, Tourism involves everything. It involves human resources, accounting, gardening, food and beverage, everything that you can think about is needed for a tourism product to be successful. 
Madam Speaker, we're also very pleased that we wanted to move past the entry level to give Caymanian people opportunity and success. And one of the things we were finding was that it's somewhere between 35,000 and 40,000 US dollars to go abroad to a hospitality school. Um, we took the opportunity to contact Johnson & Wales, one of the most well-recognized hospitality schools in the world. And we were successful in having a, a very good relationship with the president of Dr. Rice, the president of the school. And we have succeeded in securing a scholarship from the school itself of $15,000 if you have a 3.5 grade point, and $10,000 if you have a 3.0 grade point, and it scales down 2.5 to 5,000. But it also allows that with the government scholarship or the tourism scholarship combined, that you will have enough scholarship money to go to Johnson & Wales, turnkey, including food, including room, including books, and school, classwork, and the scholarship from the school and from the Cayman Island Government, Department of Tourism, or Education, will make you whole, that you will have nothing to repay when you come back with the work experience part of it and to take a job. And, and I would say, Madam Speaker, that everyone that we know that has come back is now working in the industry, um, and some have actually moved from, from different um, hotels for better opportunities. <laughs> Madam Speaker, um, Ready to Work program is also in place. We want to make sure that, that Caymanians know that it is in place if they want to get into the tourism industry and participate. Um, I think Vermeer spoke about it. But again, it's another one of the tools of trying to get people introduced into the tourism industry because we have depended and, and been so reliant on the financial industry, the, the lawyers, the accountants, and all of the opportunities that provided there. We, we didn't look and accept and sometimes take advantage of the opportunities that Order, please. I mean, you can't do that. We can only have one member speaking at one time. Madam Speaker, as you can see from the brief synopsis of educational opportunities that we have put in place. We are working to move and give opportunity to as many Caymanians as possible to take advantage of the tourism industry. And we feel very comfortable that we're having success in providing this type of opportunity. Madam Speaker, I want to move to Cayman Airways. Turning our attention to the national flag carrier, the ministry and the Department of Tourism has strategic relationship and responsibility to grow and drive visitation to the Cayman Islands. One way this is accomplished is through ongoing business relations with the national flag carrier, as well as with the other major legacy carriers that transport visitors to our shores. It is a pleasure to advise this honorable house that Cayman Airways has maintained a strong financial standing, the first emerged last year. This turnaround in fortunes is a manifestation of the policies of this government taking effect, leading the airline to growth and prosperity. And I thank the Minister of Finance for his work and stewardship in, in some of the strategies that were put in place to drive some of this success. Projections indicate that the airline is in the strongest position ever and is currently ahead of last fiscal year. It expects to finish this fiscal year, end of June, with a net profit of four million US dollars. Year over year, Northeast region continues to account for the largest visitor arrivals. 
the Cayman Islands, delivering more than 25% in overall visitation. They're also, Madam Speaker, the highest spending group that come. I recognize the Honorable Premier. We've now reached the hour of interruption. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that standing order 10 2 be suspended in order that the business of the House may continue beyond the hour of interruption. The question is that standing order 10-2 be suspended to allow the business of the House to continue beyond the hour of interruption. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those against, no. The ayes have it. Accordingly, standing order 10-2 is hereby suspended. I once again recognize the Honorable Deputy Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I was talking about Cayman Airways and we were talking about the visitation from the Northeast region, which continues to account for the largest visitor arrivals to the Cayman Islands, delivering more than 25% of their overall visitation. Northeast region of the United States, thank you. Amen. Additionally, since expanding the Southwest market with Cayman Airways in 2012 and American Airlines in 2015, we've seen a positive increase in visitation from this area. The end of 2015 arrivals from Southwest registered over 8% growth, and the region is positioned to remain as a very strong market for Cayman. Madam Speaker, the additional air seat capacity from the Southwest region to the Cayman Islands will impact our economy through an increase in multi-generational and family travel, along with a consistent flow of business travelers. Diving, leisure getaways, weddings, and honeymoons are also some of the top regions, reasons Southwest travelers are attracted to the Cayman Islands. Given more air capacity, the Cayman Islands Department of Tourism will provide promotional support to increase destination awareness and bookings. Additional seat capacity from a modernized Cayman Airways fleet, along with the expanded year-round service from American Airlines, is set to drive visitation levels from Dallas, particularly over the summer months when it is most needed to flatten the effects of seasonality. What that basically means is that we have rooms available in summer, Madam Speaker. The growth of Dallas airlift through Cayman Airways creates a dual opportunity to promote the Cayman Islands in Texas and to develop new business. First, research has shown us that the catchment area for persons who travel out of Dallas-Fort Worth Airport includes surrounding cities, with some travelers willing to drive up to three hours. Second, the Dallas airlift serves as a direct connection point to the West Coast and Midwest. At present, this route is predominantly led by American via their existing networks. And Madam Speaker, when we, when we talk about the Midwest and the West Coast, we look at pockets of wealth. And, and you look at San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, Vancouver, and you look at how you get to penetrate that market to make sure that, that the ones that would enjoy Cayman know that it's easy to get to Cayman and the opportunity is there. Dallas offers more opportunities for travelers to connect to the Cayman Islands, which will help to realize increased feeder market from these centers of wealth. And I'm pleased, very pleased to say today, Madam Speaker, that Cayman Airways is now analyzing the opportunity to add year-round flights two days per week to Dallas starting in this winter season. Madam Speaker, not too long ago, Cayman Airways announced that it would be investing in a new fleet of aircraft, which will enhance the travel experience from beginning to end. The new planes will offer in-flight entertainment, Wi-Fi access for passengers, will also facilitate 
opportunities to service new gateways. Ultimately, the modernization of Cayman Airways fleet will position the airlines as the leader with the newest fleet in the region. The range that we now have on our 737-300s is Dallas. We will now be able to look at some of the cities I mentioned earlier in our core market, which is the United States and Canada. From an operational perspective, Madam Speaker, the benefit of the modernization includes these planes are brand new, the fleet will be more fuel efficient, allowing for longer distance, increased passenger capacity. The Boeing 737 MAX offers 8% lower operating costs, increases fuel efficiency by 18%. The tourism benefits will be an updated modern fleet, which will enhance the travel experience for not only us Caymanians, but also the visitors that we look forward to welcoming. Increased efficiency for local visitors increased seat capacity, more route options, improved in-flight experience, investment supports increase in room stock, increased benefits for the economy through increased visitation, increase in, in visitation, boosting tourism growth, help to sustain the future of tourism in Cayman, it's a premier destination better connectivity to the world. And Madam Speaker, this one I, I think is one that we should not miss at all. That as we have put ourselves in a position to grow our tourism industry by 20% because of new room stock, that means that we have to have more airlift in to balance and fill those rooms. Cayman Airways has approximately 450 Caymanians working for that airline. We have the opportunity to grow that airline, which would empower more jobs. And this goes from the CEO, who as we know, is a Caymanian, to the VP, all the way down. Um, so the jobs are not low level jobs, they're all the way through. But it would be remiss of us if we didn't take the opportunity to improve our airlift, improve our airlift through Cayman Airways and provide more jobs and more opportunity to grow the economy of Cayman for the Caymanian people themselves. Because make no mistake, Madam Speaker, airlift will come. And once there's rooms to be filled, more air airlift will come. But that airlift will not provide the same number of jobs that growing Cayman Airways will without any additional expense to government. No government guarantee. Um, it will be done through central tenders, through all of the best practice ways to accommodate the four new planes. Madam Speaker, I want to talk about the shoulder season and some of the niches that, that we chase and follow as opportunity. Our growing markets that we're talking about have established ourselves as a leisure destination. And the Ministry of Tourism is seizing the opportunities to boost arrivals by developing the niches. This includes providing support to grow areas such as meetings, incentives, weddings, honeymoons, which already occur on a fairly consistent basis. It also includes laying the foundation to facilitate development of other niche areas such as festivals and sports tourism. By way of example, the annual Cayman International Film Festival, or K-Film, which debuted in 2015, is an annual multi-day event that has been designed to showcase the Cayman Islands as a world-class filming destination, as well as the customary screenings and gala celebrity event. K-Film incorporates workshops, panel discussions, question and answer sessions with filmmakers, which connects with the audience on a much deeper level. Showcasing the Cayman Islands as a movie destination, 
is part of the overarching marketing strategy to heighten awareness of the Cayman Islands brand. Movie production in Caribbean destinations is a fast-growing and lucrative niche market that could potentially attract millions of dollars and serve as a catalyst for temporary employment. Even small budget films typically spend upwards of a million dollars on location and must, by necessity, hire locals, rent accommodations, and transportation throughout the duration of the project. Madam Speaker, the knock-on effect would also spill into the number of other associated areas such as catering, props, etc., as well as supporting the development of KPhil for obvious benefits it can provide. It is hoped that by opening up our islands to the film industry, Cayman's young and aspiring filmmakers and what's, what's the term of music? What's this one do with music? And audio technical individuals would also have the opportunity to practice their craft here at home rather than being forced to seek opportunities outside of our borders. Madam Speaker, I take this opportunity to recognize Councillor for Tourism because quite honestly, this has been his initiative and if it had not been for the hard work that he's put into this over the last year and a half, it would not be the success and show the potential that it, that it now does. So I think Councillor Hugh knows how much work he's put into it and, and uh, he should be recognized for it. Madam Speaker, sports tourism is another example of a niche market area that serves as a seamless addition to our island's tourism product. It fits well within typically slower travel months of May, June, September, and parts of November. And it also a key element in government's multi-level strategy to build traffic in the shoulder season and eliminate the peaks and valleys of high, low season by keeping a steady flow of visitors. And Madam Speaker, I have to tell you that the Minister for Sports has this speech down perfect, that when they come and look at, at different events, he explains to them when it's good for them to do it and when it's not good for them to do it. So we enjoy a very close working relationship in developing sports tourism. And I have to say that, that we've certainly had, we've enjoyed doing it and we've certainly had great success with it. The events would fall under this category, include the recently held Cayman Invitational Track Meet. Madam Speaker, with your permission, Madam Speaker, I just want to table a advertisement that was unsolicited by us, but I want to just start to give you a snapshot of the value of what sports tourism actually does for the Cayman Islands. So order. about this. So, Madam Speaker, this is, this is NBC Sports. NBC Sports. It has a picture of Usain Bolt on it. Usain Bolt called his first race since August 29th, Rusty, a 100-meter win at 10.5 at the Cayman Invitational on Saturday night. Now, Madam Speaker, NBC, global recognition, the value of this is something that we continue to drive. But, Madam Speaker, I want to table one more thing because sometimes these things don't really get understood. This, Madam Speaker, is from the Manchester Evening News, the UK. It says, National Champions Manchester City sweep the, broad, sweep the board of individual honors after triumphing in the Caribbean. Manchester's all-conquering under 15 have added more silverware to their collection by winning the Cayman Invitational Youth Cup. John Mullen's team won the national title this season. And Madam Speaker, it talks about who they beat, um, all the U.S. teams, 
and the enjoyment that they had in Cayman. And again, the worth of what this is to our sports tourism product and what this means. But I wanted to do those in tandem because of the overreaching and overarching part of this is when you think of on the same weekend, you had Usain Bolt and you had Manchester City. So you're a financial person and you're looking at the newspaper in Geneva, London, New York, and, and you're looking at any place in the world that you can go. And you see in that sports section, Usain Bolt's in Cayman, Manchester City's in Cayman. It makes you understand that when you holistically put out as much information and reach a certain target, it makes them say, if those kind of globally known people and brands are in Cayman, I also want to go there. So the, the coordination and the effort. Order, the, order. The coordination and the effort between the minister of. Who's that? And Madam Speaker, we also talk about another football, regional football tournament that happens in three weeks, <laughs> the Norseka Volleyball Tournament. Minister, Let are you also going to table Hussein um, question as to what's one plus two? Because you could do it at the same time. <laughs> I wish I had it, Madam Speaker, I would. <laughs> that's, I think that's what you were. Um, Maybe I can get the Minister of Sports, when he speaks, to table that at that time, Madam Speaker. I think it's a very good idea. <coughs> yeah, that was a, an event we were having in Cayman Brac, Madam Speaker, where we invited all of the, the school children of the island to meet Usain at the airport. And a little man, I call him, because he's certainly not a little boy. He's five years old. He speaks like most people in this house. And he came up and he took the microphone and he looked at him and he said, Mr. Usain Bolt, do you know what one plus two is? And the whole place just erupted, including Usain Bolt. And it took a little while for him to, to answer. So I, I think that it went viral. It had almost 400,000 hits, 300, 330, how many? 337,000. So again, this is, the, this is the type of opportunity that happens that we're very happy that... Um, a growing niche market. And I'm so happy that the leader of the opposition is pleased that we, we did that. Yeah. Madam Speaker, we also um, recognize Carnival, Pirates Week, the different areas that bring in our shoulders and help to build build um, arrivals. Madam Speaker, from the economic perspective, influx of visitors provides intermediate revenue to service providers and is widely dispersed within the tourism and hospitality sectors. Madam Speaker, Still on the subject of driving visitation, I turn our attention to our island's number one land-based attraction, which is in West Bay. It is the Cayman Turtle Farm. As members of this honorable house would be aware, the turtle farm is principally engaged in various aspects surrounding the conservation and research of sea turtles, captive breeding, and farming of green sea turtles to supply the local market with turtle meat products. It also provides a high quality land based visitor attraction featuring sea turtles and other island wildlife. As part of the attraction and to earn revenue, the company also operates restaurant and gift shops on site. Madam Speaker, members of this honorable house are aware that the company operates in Northwest Point in close proximity to several other visitor attractions, such as the Dolphin Aquarium, a motor museum rum cake outlet, Hell, a couple of other restaurants, Crack Kunk, and several popular dive operations and Shore Dive. Simply said, 
Madam Speaker, this is the anchor for the West Bay area. What would happen if it was not there? The budget for 2016, 2017 includes line item E149 for the operation of Cayman Turtle Farm, trading as Island Wildlife Encounter. It's for $12.7 million over the 18 month period. And Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, to preface the discussion on the company's budget, I should mention that for the first time in a great many years, the company's financial statements for the year ended 30th of June, 2015, received an unqualified audit issued jointly by KPMG and the Office of the Auditor General. The company's board and management are to be congratulated for a job well done in the governance of this government-owned company. Madam, Madam Speaker, the Turtle Farms budget is keeping, fulment, keeping with fulfillment of strategic policy statement for 2015-17 and aligns in several respects, for example, conservation of our biological diversity and ecologically sustainable development. Madam Speaker, the Turtle Farm greatly contributes to the conservation of sea turtles in the wild around the Cayman Islands. As well as to sustaining local culinary traditions, I'm most sure, if not all members of this house have dined, I'm most sure that all members of this house have dined on turtle meat, as its consumption has been a part of Caymanian history and culture for generations. By making a stock of green turtle meat derived from self sustaining closed cycle farming available for consumption, the turtle farm is significantly reducing the poaching of turtles from the wild. Madam Speaker, the undeniable evidence of that has now been presented in a recently published Darwin Plus funded research project overseen by our Department of Environment. This study on the socioeconomics of turtle meat production revealed that the farm, and more specifically its production and sale of turtle meat, is a major and vital factor in sustaining sea turtle populations around Cayman Islands. Madam Speaker, the turtle farm now operates as a tourist attraction and a wildlife park, and it is the sole provider of turtle meat for consumption. The vision for the longer term is to expand its operations through the creation of a new entity that would focus on education and research and would be funded as a charitable, not-for-profit, private entity. This would permit the sourcing of grants and donations to help fund the various research, conservation, and education initiatives pertaining to various species of sea turtles, not just green sea turtles. Madam Speaker, this vision has come as a result of board and management in collaboration with a scientist from North America, realized that there were so many opportunities that existed to expand the turtle farm's impact in the field of sea turtle research, conservation, and education. The turtle farm is committing to continue participation in research on sea turtle in-house and in collaboration with overseas researchers to continue hosting students and graduates from local and overseas schools educating them on sea turtles and other island wildlife. Madam Speaker, the turtle farm every year has had a reduction in its equity projection. 2012-13, it had a reduction, 800,000, CI, million US, 14, 500,000, 15, 500,000, and this year a reduction. On an annualized basis, this year the turtle farm will receive 8,700,000. Last year it received, sorry, Madam Speaker, this, this year it will receive 9 million. Last year it received Madam Speaker, this year it will receive 
8,745,000. Last year it received 9 million. But the point I want to make here is there's a sovereign debt that is attached to this funding. And the sovereign debt is 69% of that funding. So $5,841,000 of this goes to pay off a debt for this entity, for this anchor, for this tourism product, for this number one tourism attraction in the Cayman Islands. 2600000 goes for operation. Every time you see a taxi, a tour bus, a rent-a-car, a family that is heading to West Bay, 70% of them are going to go to the turtle farm. So if we tear this apart from what the value is to the tourism product, I think that we would be very safe in saying that we are reducing the operational cost of the turtle farm. We're looking ahead with a vision to expand on its research and the opportunity for global recognition for not only the green turtle, but Kemp Redley and, and others. And we are providing a much needed tourism attraction because that's what we are in, the tourism business. Um, and Madam Speaker, the vision of looking at how we grow um, this school, so to speak, or this research center ties in with the actual repayment of the major debt will be in three years. So, so we have some, some opportunity there as we look forward to that. Madam Speaker, the Cayman Island Port Authority has as I mentioned earlier, increased its income from the arrival of cruise passengers. Um, 2015 was $2 million. It was mentioned that it was underperforming by $2.2 million. And I just wanted to, to have a quick um, statement to that. The Honorable Minister of Finance is correct that it is underperforming, but it's underperforming that its surplus net profit in June 2016 will be 755, $700,000. It was on track to have a net profit of $4,700,000. Had to, the reason for the underperformance is that the projected actual surplus for June 30, 2016 of $4,700,000 was reduced by the estimated defined benefit for post-employment health care of $4 million, hence the reduced surplus of $700,000. The numbers for the year forecast actual was extrapolated in the PACI March 31, 2016 actual financial statements. And that, Madam Speaker, is something that all of the statutory bodies are going to have to, to recognize and face. But the Port Authority itself is healthy. Um, it is showing a profit. And, and the mere fact that it could put $4 million aside into the defined benefit, I think, is positive news for all of the work that takes place there um, and all the employees that, that work. I just want to touch briefly on the new Port Director, Madam Speaker. He's a young Caymanian, Clement Reed. He took over the role in November last year. I think that if you've had a chance to walk around there and take a look, Clement is doing a good job. Um, he holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering, has 10 years experience, and he was the existing, was an existing employee at the Port Authority. He was promoted in 2001 to Assistant Port Director, to Deputy Director, and subsequently to his current position by rising through the ranks. Mr. Reed has become well versed in the port's operations and his appointment virtually created a seamless transition at the port itself. Um, we're very pleased with another young Caymanian taking up that post. The Tourism Attraction Board 
Madam Speaker, is a, it's moved its offices from a rented site to the Pedro St. James accommodation. An effort to grow business, Pedro St. James has added a new cruise line tours and expressions of interest have been requested for a lease on the on-site cafe. It's anticipated the lease should be signed the next week to commence operations, 1st of October, 2016. Strategic marketing plan covering initiatives for Pedro St. James and the Queen Elizabeth Botanic Park has been completed and accepted by the board. The remaining tourism attraction entities are to be added to the strategic marketing plan plan completed 30th of July 2016. Madam Speaker, the growth of Pedro St. James and the Botanic Park will show an increase of tourists in the Eastern District and we continue to work to build that relationship with the cruise lines and with the hotels to push them into some of our attractions that are absolutely fabulous in the Eastern District. Turning our attention to the National Weather um, Department, Madam Speaker, I'd like to provide a brief update the members of this house will be pleased to note that succession planning and training and upward mobility of Caymanians are important areas being addressed during this fiscal period. Mid-level technician training will be provided for existing technician, future promotion to mid-level technician position. Once trained, the technician will be able to take on more responsibility, enabling another staff member to become better trained. Honorable the Minister, you have 14 minutes remaining. somebody. At the completion of our studies, um, administrative manager is currently receiving training from the University of Portsmouth to assist supporting HR function. At the completion, in addition to enhancing the services provided, the HR manager will also be able to support the ministry HR function. Two members of staff are currently pursuing masters, one being director. The qualification is a requirement for the post and the course will be completed at the end of 2017, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I can't leave here today without talking about Cayman Brack and Little Cayman. Talking more about them. Turning our focus now, Madam Speaker, um, thank you. Turning our attention now to the sister islands, Madam Speaker, Cayman Brack and Little Cayman are in the early stages of their development life cycles compared to Grand Cayman. Government has remained mindful that extra stimulus is required to create a sustainable economy and we are addressing the deficiencies and taking advantage of the opportunities. We pledge to bring more opportunity to the sister islands and we are delivering, Madam Speaker, to help grow the economy of Cayman Brack and Little Cayman, government has focused its attention on attracting more visitors to the island, upgrading and expanding Charles Kirkconnell International Airport, introducing direct international flights to the United States and Cuba, facilitating back office jobs in the public and private sector. Madam Speaker, as you all know, an example of this is the Cayman Airways ticket counter and the redundancy that is there um, if Grand Cayman needs it and the overflow goes there. Um, a very good addition. I think it's an example of what other companies can look at and what they can do. Um, tremendous labor pool there available for back office work like this. Perhaps the most visible recent change to take place in Cayman Brack is the introduction of the Saab 340B plus aircraft. Madam Speaker, the larger aircraft increased the number of seats into the sister islands and as a result, the passenger arrivals have increased by over 20%. Boosting inter-island and international travel to and from Cayman Brack is having a direct economic input impact, but that's not the only thing we've done. We've also created more jobs. Jobs in the fire service, jobs in the tourism industry, jobs in district administration, jobs at Cayman Airways, Jobs at the airport, Cayman Island Airport Authority, more custom officers, more immigration officers, and more security. All needed because of taking advantage 
of an airport that wasn't being used and could provide international um, flights into Cuba by Cayman Airways, which transferring 110 people on a weekly basis through there means you need all of the accommodating services that they require. Madam Speaker, as the economy strengthened, visitor arrivals increased, hotels expanded in response, as we saw with the Brack Reef Resort, which recently upgraded its accommodations and added a new freeform pool, multi-level food and beverage area. Also, Madam Speaker, La Soleil Dior added a boutique hotel to its cottage accommodations. We trust that the success of our policies, particularly with respect to the increase in tourism, will encourage small business development and investment in infrastructure to support tourism's growth. Madam Speaker, as well as facilitating growth in tourism, government has also been focused on stimulating growth in the private sector through the provision of incentives to investors. Premier spoke about an initiative that's being looked at for high net worth individuals. Cayman Brac might not have the necessary social infrastructure to support big business, but it is well suited as a location for the provision of back office support services. It is envisioned that these could include back office support for HR, accounting, administrative, or IT functions to businesses established either in Grand Cayman or farther afield. Government is therefore in the process of finalizing the details and criteria for the provision of a certificate of direct investment to eligible applicants in addition to successfully creating jobs in the tourism and hospitality industry. Attracting specific types of investment to Cayman Brac will lead to the creation of administrative jobs and expand the employment pool, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, a barometer for what has actually taken place is the amount of cargo that comes in to your island. Manifestation of growth is that in 2013, from Grand Cayman, which is the hub for cargo into Cayman Brac and Little Cayman, 1,505 20-foot containers arrived. In 2014, an increase of 15%, 1,736 20-foot containers arrived. And in 2015, 1,862 20-foot containers arrived, an increase of 7%. So, Madam Speaker, with the 20% increase in air arrivals and 15%, 7% increase, which would be about a 22 cumulative increase, we can see that the numbers provide that Cayman Brac and Little Cayman are growing. Maybe we would like it to grow faster, Madam Speaker, but we have to continue with the initiatives that we're putting in place for that foundation. Madam Speaker, the district administration budget allocation for 2016 is on a yearly basis to be able to compare it to 2015 is $8,406,000. 2015 was 8110 That's an increase of 4%. And I'm pleased to repeat that the Premier's announcement that the civil servants, which quite a few jobs in Cayman Brac are civil servants, will receive a 2.2% gratuity to recognize their contribution over the last budget year in the June pay period. An example is, Madam Speaker, somebody earning $30,000 will receive $660 extra in their June pay. $30,000 a year. With respect to the budget allocation for district admin, once again, through careful management in other areas, the budget DAT 2 and DAT 3 remain strong, and all core government initiatives have been protected, specifically these. Passport and travel documents, processing, the government building in Cayman Brac, registration applications for corporate and vital information, organizing official visits, development, implement, and support tourism and business initiatives, vehicle and miscellaneous inspection, child daycare and preschool, customs and immigration, treasury services, sporting, coaching, community sport programs, 
Minister, you have five minutes remaining. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Disaster management, preparedness, and response, construction and maintenance of public facilities and infrastructure, collection, preservation, and display material evidence significant to our culture, history, and heritage. Collection of documentation, preservation of material, providing exhibitions and displays, general public access to them, and the museum facility. Preservation of our historical sites. Madam Speaker, I think that gives great comfort that how we continue to work at Public Works and District Administration have all been funded and protected. The Ministry, District Administration will continue to work on the interior of the multi-purpose hall in the bluff. The interior of the building has now been rendered and primed. The next step in the design of the hall is to meet the multi-purpose function for the Camembert community, which will include the future transition to a school hall. To oversee this process, the steering group has been formed, which consists of both the Ministry of District Administration and the Ministry of Education staff. A contract has been awarded to DDL Studio in order to provide design modifications and project management. The Ministry of Education combined with the Ministry of DAT will also embark on producing an outline business case to analyze the mer merger of Cayman Brack schools, take the opportunity to see how the bluff multi-purpose hall can fit into that. Madam Speaker, sports programs in the Sister Islands, all over the world we know that participation of sports in sports is a great unifier and popular recreational activity. It holds true in the Sister Islands, which has 300 active participants in Cayman Brack and 65 in Little Cayman. Therefore, pleased the Cayman Brack playing field project will continue with the construction of a 25 meter pool which will be able to facilitate local and international meets. The investment to upgrade the playing field provides benefit across the community and supports a number of sports programs. A daycare football program, a grassroots football program, a youth football program, a men's football program, Little Cayman Community Program. 300 active participants. Learn to swim after school program, junior basketball program, volleyball, BRAC athletic club program for track and field, weight training, tennis program, talent development. And let us not lose sight of the young people that this has helped in many ways. Today we have Thomas Jackson Dilbert, who was scouted by a Dutch football, coach, football scout and was recruited and spent three weeks in Holland um, with professional football teams and tryouts. Ronaldo Morrison and Michael Martin are conducting trials with the Cayman Isles under 20 football team and people who have come through Mitchum Sanford's football program, Brian Martin, Stephen Tatum, Shayla Connor, Carrie Anthony, Ronaldo Morris, Ronald Morris, Michael Sanford have all played for the national team. Madam Speaker, the Marine Police Unit it was set up at a close of 2014, combined with the agencies in the Sister Islands, and a help to deter criminal activity, improve the safety and security through an extended presence of the Joint Marine Unit and a base operation in Cayman Brack. Primary purpose is to provide search and rescue, maritime security, and border protection operations specifically for the Sister Islands. Madam Speaker, the Joint Marine Unit Attachment as it has been designated, consists of dedicated patrol vessel, team of officers from Immigration, Customs, and the RCIP, the Department of Environment. The presence of the Joint Marine Unit in Cayman Brack enhances the border protection and search research, search and rescue capabilities of the Sister Islands and is an important part of coordinating, mitigate other risks and threats, in addition to form protection for our citizens. Madam Speaker, the affordable housing program. It has two houses now in progress and two are being, the ground is being prepared to break ground on two other ones in this new budget. Madam Speaker, I think I'm getting close to my time. Is it possible to get an extra five minutes? Madam Speaker, I would. I recognize Honorable Leader of the Opposition. I would move. After I answer. Are you going to? I will go and rule for the suspension of standing order so that the member could finish his speech. Honorable Premier, you wish to change 
the standing orders to allow extra time. Uh, I, the chair has the discretion to allow the member to continue his thought within a reasonable amount of time. Um, if you have more than five minutes, five minutes. please proceed. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as you know, the demand for well-built, affordable homes is growing. And I know you, as I am very pleased through the prudent management of public funds that we continue with this program, as well as meeting the very real need for moderate income housing. These are life-changing homes for the citizens that get them and the pride in the community that they have on both um, areas of Cayman Brac where they have been built. I think we all want this program to continue and succeed, and it has had great success. Madam Speaker, <coughs> Faith Hospital continues to function at an extremely high level. It has had many upgrades during the year. One of the most notable is the now interaction between the helicopter team and the collaboration between Royal Cayman Islands Police. The helicopter has made three or four evacuations, air vacs out of there, but now there is a dedicated helicopter pad on the back area of Faith Hospital. The pad has been prepared and it was used successfully on the 28th of May. In this budget, Madam Speaker, there's also a new ambulance provided for Cayman Brack and there's also a new building um, to be built there to provide storage and Um, Madam Speaker, we also have a 26-foot Jupiter Customs boat that is due to arrive in the next 30 days, and our customs dog, um, enforcement dog, is about six months late, so we have to find out what happened to the dog in the training program. Public Works has um, some much new equipment, which is desperately needed, coming, and the continuation of pipe water, a great success for the island itself as it continues to move easterly up the island. Um, they were hoping to get to the hospital by the end of June, but, but that won't, won't happen. Um, but I think they're pretty much by the Banksville area now. So I'm um, showing a great, great project. Madam Speaker, the situation in Little Cayman is also encouraging. The infrastructure enhancement continues, the road resurfacing. The, um, road resurfacing also on the north coast, and the dock on the north side of Little Cayman that was spoken about earlier was completed, but there has to be an addition onto it this year. Um, and this, Madam Speaker, is basically the only dock in a 10-mile radius that allows people, um, public dock, that allows people to use it, and whether it it's, it's can be used because of being able to get in the channel, um, if there's some type of, of need to take a sick or injured um, person off a vessel. So it has many functions and we're quite happy to, to have that. The first sports program took place in Little Cayman and we see a, a very stable uh, number of guests coming to Little Cayman and, and of course a major announcement um, coming out today about the dark purchase of the Ken Hall property. The Home repair program will continue, and this is the home repairs for senior citizens, and that's in the budget. Um, very good program that allows the senior citizens to stay in their homes. The Little Cayman Sports hosted its first awards banquet, April 2016, and Little Cayman now has active sporting programs in basketball, volleyball, and football. Madam Speaker, the Minister for Planning, um, myself, met with the group from Ten Island Challenge. Um, it, the Ten Island Challenge group has a mandate to accelerate the transition of Caribbean island economies from a heavy dependence on fossil fuels to renewable sources. It is in line with the government's broad outcome to develop strategic plan to diversify the sources of energy. Consequently, Madam Speaker, we from January this year, there has been dialogue between themselves and the two ministries. We met um, when they were here in May. 
for the Carolic Conference, a very good meeting. And we looked at the regulatory environment for electricity, private sector companies involved in power generation, ongoing renewable energy initiatives for the Cayman Islands, and ability to promote Cayman Islands as a transitioning to using renewable energy. We are now waiting on next steps from them to continue the discussion, but very valuable. Madam Speaker, scorecard with respect to the promises government has kept in the Sister Islands is an impressive one. We pledge to create local jobs through tourism development. We are working on creating the back office jobs through legislation and development. Complete the sports complex on the bluff, improve inter-island air service, continue the building of the boat dock in Little Cayman, continue pipe water throughout the communities. Air arrivals are an indicator, they're up, cargo is up. Madam Speaker, there are many accolades and awards that have been given to the Cayman Islands, and I will not read the three pages of them that I have here, just to say that we are extremely well recognized, and um, many awards have been given to the dive industry, and the stayover industry, and the cruise industry, um, because of the destination of the Cayman Islands. Outside the financial services industry, tourism is the number one service that we export. Consequently, we must be committed to ensuring that every visitor to our islands, whether for business or leisure, sport or conferencing, leaves with a positive, lasting impression and firm plans to return. Madam Speaker, from the outset of this administration, we have taken the approach that our growth and development must be inwardly driven by unearthing our people's spirit of entrepreneurship, talents, and capabilities. Ultimately, Everything that we do must give our youth hope and confidence of even brighter future when they inherit this country. I see a bright light. Madam Speaker, despite the tremendous gains, there's still much work to be done. More challenges ahead, more strategies to be articulated, more issues to confront, more targets to be achieved, and more citizens to benefit. To do all this, we have a government that represents all the interests in our country. The elected government, not afraid of hard work, and a population that expects best practice from its government. No one can doubt the resolve of this government to grasp the difficult issues of the day. Many are complex matters, and decisions are never easy. During this past year, we have never been fearful of the size of the challenge, nor have we shirked our responsibilities to the people of the Cayman Islands. We did not seek an easy way out, and we did not skimp on our efforts, Madam Speaker. We have met the challenges head on, and we have delivered. The Cayman Islands is stronger today than it has been in years, and we are achieving the goals that will benefit our people for generations to come. Madam Speaker, I take this opportunity to thank all ministers and all counselors for their hard work to the government. Madam Speaker, it would be remiss of me not to offer a word of thanks to my Chief Officer, the Director of Tourism, all the hard work, the staff, district administration, tourism, transport, as well as, as our industry partners in the private sector whom we have worked closely with over these past years. I also wish to commend the civil servants that we work with, Deputy Governor and his team, the members of the various government boards private citizens who have supported the ministry and freely giving their time for benefit in this country. We close, Madam Speaker, by thanking the Premier for his leadership and hard work. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Final call. Does any other member wish to speak? If not, I'll call an Honorable Minister of Finance to wind up. I recognize the 
Honorable fifth elected member from the District of Georgetown. And at this time, we'll take a short afternoon break. Some kind of 